Good morning. Um, thank you all for uh, coming to this session and um, attending this wonderful meeting. And thank you to Robert and to the Scleroderma Foundation for inviting me to speak um, and give the opening uh, grand lecture today. So um, as Robert said, I'm going to be talking about pulmonary hypertension and systemic sclerosis and focus on uh, the current era and um, where we stand right now. Here are my disclosures. So this is just an overview of what I'm going to cover today in this talk. Uh, first, I'm going to review the definition of pulmonary hypertension, um, review the frequency of pulmonary hypertension and systemic sclerosis, the risk factors for pulmonary arterial hypertension, and symptoms of pulmonary hypertension. Um, I will go over the guidelines for screening of PAH in scleroderma and other connective tissue diseases, review uh, the diagnostic criteria, and finally end with the current treatment options for PAH. So first of all, the definition of pulmonary hypertension. So pulmonary hypertension means high blood pressure in the lungs. And I want to emphasize the fact that this does not equal systemic hypertension. So high blood pressure in the lungs doesn't mean that you have high blood pressure throughout the rest of your body. There are five types of pulmonary hypertension that can be seen in systemic sclerosis. And pulmonary arterial hypertension, or World Health Organization, WHO group one, is the most common form of pulmonary hypertension seen in scleroderma. It's related to inflammation and scar tissue that affects the blood vessels of the lungs. And this leads to narrowing of the blood vessels, which then results in high blood pressure in the lungs. There's another form of pulmonary hypertension that's quite rare called pulmonary veno-occlusive disease, or PVOD, WHO group 1 prime. Um, this can occur in patients with scleroderma and is important because um, patients can experience complications with typical PAH therapies if they have PVOD. Pulmonary hypertension can also be related to primary heart disease, and this is considered WHO group 2. Pulmonary hypertension related to primary lung disease, and in particular interstitial lung disease in patients with scleroderma, is considered WHO group 3. And then finally, also a less common form of pulmonary hypertension is chronic thromboembolic disease. And this is related to blood clots affecting the blood vessels of the lungs. So this is a point I'm going to make over and over during this talk, um, but right heart catheterization is absolutely necessary to diagnose pulmonary hypertension. By right heart catheterization, pulmonary hypertension is defined as having a mean pulmonary artery pressure of at least 25 millimeters of mercury at rest. And right heart catheterization is extremely important to be able to differentiate the types of pulmonary hypertension. So in particular, looking at the pulmonary arterial wedge pressure, you can differentiate between pulmonary arterial hypertension and pulmonary hypertension related to heart disease. So a wedge pressure less than 15 millimeters of mercury is required for the diagnosis of PAH. Now I'm going to move on and talk about the frequency of pulmonary hypertension in systemic sclerosis. So there have been multiple studies that have um, estimated the prevalence or frequency of pulmonary hypertension in, in scleroderma. And many of the studies have indicated quite high percentages of up to 25 to 30 percent of patients with scleroderma um, ultimately getting pulmonary hypertension. Those studies were based on echocardiogram, so I'm going to focus on the more specific studies looking at right heart catheterization. The frequency of pulmonary hypertension in scleroderma is much lower by right heart catheterization, um, which is, as I mentioned, the gold standard for diagnosis. And um, many of the studies estimate closer from 4 to 13 percent. So this study in particular looked at 1165 French and Italian patients, and out of those, 206 of them were thought to be high risk for pulmonary hypertension based on pulmonary function tests and echocardiogram. Those patients underwent right heart catheterization, and 80, 83 of them had a mean pulmonary artery pressure of at least 25, giving a prevalence or frequency of pulmonary hypertension of 7% overall. And more than half of those had pulmonary arterial hypertension, so an overall prevalence of 4% of PAH. 
This is a more recent uh, U.S. study, the Pharaohs Registry, which is a multi-center U.S. registry of scleroderma patients at high risk for developing pulmonary hypertension and with new onset pulmonary hypertension that Virginia Steen started in 2006. So this uh, graph represents the patients who are at high risk for pulmonary hypertension based again on echo and pulmonary function test parameters. And you can see that uh, patients developed uh, pulmonary hypertension over follow-up time. And about 10% developed pulmonary hypertension at two years, um, about 13% at three years, and 20% uh, I'm sorry, 25% at uh, five years. In contrast, uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension is a little less common than that. Um, but again, there was a fairly high uh, incidence or new onset of pulmonary arterial hypertension with about 9% at three years and about 17% at five years. So now I'm going to review the risk factors for PAH in systemic sclerosis. There are several clinical factors that we can look at to give us a hint whether a patient's at high risk for developing pulmonary hypertension. Um, being of older age or having long-standing disease is a risk factor. And having a late onset of scleroderma, so older age at diagnosis of the scleroderma. In addition, uh, tail injectasias, which are capillaries that come to the surface of the skin, are thought to be an increased risk factor for PAH. So the increased number and size of tail injectations are important. And I just wanted to point out in these pictures that um, there's a difference between the matte or square-like tail injectations that we see in patients with scleroderma and those that are related to sun damage. So here on the right, I'm not sure if I can um, point these out, but on the right you see these large matted or square-like tail injectations, those are typical in scleroderma, whereas um, in panel B, those are kind of more spider-like tail injectations that can be seen in just routine sun damage. Pseudotumoral uh, tail injectations are defined as those that are greater than 5 millimeters in diameter, and again, the increased size of tail injectations is associated with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Another risk factor for PAH is a history of digital ulcers. So you can see on the right, there are um, some open, open sores that are very painful on the fingers. And they often heal and form uh, digital pitting scars, as you can see on the left panel at the tips of the fingers. So having a history of digital ulcers puts you at increased risk for developing PAH. And we think this is related to the fact that scleroderma is associated with underlying blood vessel or vascular disease. This is a photomicrograph of a cross-section of a digital artery from a patient with systemic sclerosis. And this patient had a history of digital ulcers and digital gangrene. And what you can see is the blue uh, staining stains scar tissue. So around the entire blood vessel, you can see that it is encased with scar tissue. And also, um, in the middle of the artery, where you should have one single layer called the endothelial cell layer, the inner layer of the blood vessel, this too is replaced by a large amount of scar tissue. So you can see there's a decreased lumen or opening of the blood vessel, leading to decreased blood flow. And this is why um, patients get severe Raynaud's and digital ulcerations in the fingers. So we think that the same exact pathology is going on in the digital arteries as is going on in the pulmonary or lung blood vessels with pulmonary arterial hypertension. So um, later on in the talk, I'm going to discuss a little bit more the definitions um, of pulmonary function tests and echocardiogram. But I did want to mention here at this point to discuss um, these features that are associated with an increased risk for developing PAH on these tests. So pulmonary function tests are tests that um, your doctor orders to assess your lung function. And the diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide, or DLCO, is associated with an increased risk of pulmonary arterial hypertension when it is low. Uh, 
So there have been various cutoffs that have been assessed, having a DLCO of less than anywhere between 50 and 70 percent of the normal predicted value has been associated with an increased risk of PAH. Um, on the right, you can see that in, in this study, a DLCO less than 60 percent predicted increased the risk for PAH by 37 fold. Another study didn't show as dramatic of a difference, um, but of note, this was actually looking for exercise-induced pulmonary arterial hypertension, which, which um, may be different from pulmonary hypertension at rest. And this study on the left found a DLCO less than 50% predicted increased the risk for PAH by tenfold. And then when you compare the ratio of the force vital capacity to the DLCO, if this, this number is high, this means that the DLCO is relatively low compared to the force vital capacity. So if it's high, greater than 1.6, there's also an increased risk for PAH. Now I'm going to move on to the echocardiogram. And first, I just wanted to describe the normal blood flow through the heart. So um, you'll see on uh, the panel on, on the left, um, in the first figure, which is uh, on the right, you see that there is deoxygenated or uh, noted by the blue coloring of blood that goes through the right atrium, which then moves to the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve, and then out through the pulmonary artery. That's where oxygen is added to the blood, and then it comes back into the left side of the heart and then can be pumped to the rest of the body. So what can often happen as pressure increases in the lungs is that it can actually push blood back from the right ventricle through um, the tricuspid valve into the right atrium again. And this is uh, noted here by blood leaking back into the right atrium. And that is called tricuspid regurgitation. So we measure the velocity of how quickly the, the blood moves back through the tricuspid valve into the right atrium. And the maximum velocity of tricuspid regurgitation can be very helpful in estimating risk for pulmonary arterial hypertension. So if that number is greater than three, even in someone who's completely asymptomatic, that's an increased risk factor for PAH. The um, threshold is a little bit lower, about 2.8 meters per second for the maximum velocity if there are any symptoms of shortness of breath. The other important parameter that we can glean from the echocardiogram is the right ventricular systolic pressure. And this is an estimate of the mean pulmonary artery pressure in uh, the lungs that you would get on right heart catheterization. So it's not entirely accurate. Um, there is a lot of um, variability in the measurement of the right ventricular systolic pressure, but it can be used as a good screening tool to tell us whether or not a patient's at high risk for PAH. So if you have a RVSP of greater than 40 millimeters of mercury and you're asymptomatic, you're still considered high risk. If you have a level of at least 35 and any symptoms at all, again, we're concerned and this is high risk. What also can be helpful is looking at the annual change in right ventricular systolic pressure over time. So this is a study done by Ami Shah and colleagues at Johns Hopkins, and they performed serial annual uh, echocardiograms on their scleroderma patients and found that if the right ventricular systolic pressure increased by at least two millimeters of mercury per year, patients were at five-fold increased risk for developing PAH over time. And as this number increases, so greater than three millimeters of mercury per year, the risk increases even further to six-fold. So uh, your rheumatologist should be ordering autoantibodies at the time of diagnosis of scleroderma. And it's been found that these um, blood antibodies are um, very helpful in determining what types of internal organ disease patients are at risk for. So there are certain antibodies that are associated with a high risk of developing PAH. And the ones that um, clinically can be tested for by your doctor include the anti-centromere antibodies, having a nucleolar pattern on the anti-nuclear antibody test, the anti-U1-RNP or ribonucleoprotein antibody, 
and antiphospholipid antibodies, in particular the beta-2 glycoprotein antibodies. And finally, actually the absence of the anti-SCL70 or the topoisomerase 1 antibody is associated with an increased risk for PAH. There are other uh, more novel antibodies that are really only available in research labs, but are thought to possibly be involved in actually causing uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension in patients with scleroderma. There's another blood test uh, called the N-terminal pro-brain natriuretic peptide, or NT-pro-BNP. And there's been a lot of research done on this uh, blood marker in the past years. And it's been shown uh, that this blood test is associated with the presence of pulmonary arterial hypertension in patients with scleroderma. So this blood test measures the level of a hormone that's released when there's um, volume or pressure overload of the heart. And if you have very high levels, greater than 97th percentile of normal, um, there's an increased risk of de developing pH of 10 times normal over the next three years. In addition to um, giving us a sign whether the presence of pH is there, um, NT-proBNP levels also correlate heavily with um, mean pulmonary artery pressure on right heart catheterization. So it can also give us a sign of how severe the disease is. Next, I want to go over the symptoms of pulmonary hypertension that can be seen in systemic sclerosis. And I want to emphasize that in early stages, PAH can be asymptomatic. And this is why your rheumatologists encourage you to undergo screening for pulmonary hypertension, even though you're completely asymptomatic. So as um, pH progresses, symptoms of pulmonary hypertension can occur, and they're listed here, and you should definitely be aware of these symptoms. So shortness of breath, and this can be with or without exercise, uh, increased fatigue, which is fairly nonspecific, chest pain, palpitations or feel, feeling your pulse racing, swelling of the legs, ankles, arms, or belly, feeling weak, and uh, feeling lightheaded or dizzy, and um, passing out is often um, a sign and very concerning. So as I mentioned, because um, you can often be asymptomatic but still have PAH, especially in early stages, um, rheumatologists have gotten together and um, have developed guidelines for whether or not a patient uh, with a rheumatic disease should undergo screening for PAH. So what tests will your rheumatologist order in order to screen for PAH? I've already mentioned these, um, but I just want to review more discreetly what these tests are. So pulmonary function tests. Um, measure a couple of things. First, uh, the lung volumes, or how much you're able to blow out from your lungs. This is called uh, the force vital capacity, or FVC. I mentioned the diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide, and this measures how well the lungs move oxygen from the lungs to the blood in order to oxygenate the body. The trans echocardiogram is an ultrasound of the heart, and it measures quite a few different parameters, including the heart function, the heart wall size, the pressure in the lungs, as I mentioned, and can tell us whether there's fluid around the heart. The nt pro -BNP, as I already mentioned, is a blood test that measures the stress on the heart. So several screening algorithms have been developed um, to uh, look for PAH and scleroderma patients over the years. And I'll be discussing um, three different ones that are commonly cited. Um, the European Society of Cardiology, or European Respiratory Society, developed an algorithm back in 2009 based on symptoms as well as findings on the echocardiogram. The Australian Scleroderma Interest Group, subsequently in 2012, published an algorithm based on the nt pro -BNP levels and pulmonary function test results. And then more recently, the DETECT algorithm was a um, international collaboration that uh, determined an algorithm in patients who were considered at high risk for pH, having a disease duration of at least three years and a low diffusion capacity of less than 60% predicted. <clears throat> 
So first, the ESC or ERS guidelines. Um, this this um, algorithm depends on echo findings and whether or not there are symptoms. So as I mentioned earlier in the talk, the maximum tricuspid regurgitation velocity is often looked at to determine whether a patient should be referred for right heart catheterization. So these guidelines used a cutoff of 3.4 in patients who were asymptomatic to refer for right heart catheterization. If the maximum velocity is between 2.8 and 3.4 with any symptoms at all, then referral was suggested to be made. And if the velocity was less than 2.8, there were symptoms and also other abnormalities on the echocardiogram, then a right heart catheterization was recommended. So these guidelines are probably a little bit more conservative than um, our later guidelines, which I'll be discussing at this point. So the ASIG uh, algorithm looks at the NT pro BNP and the pulmonary function test results. So they break it down into component A, having NT pro BNP greater than 210 picograms per milliliter, and component B, looking at a DLCO of less than 70% predicted and a FVC to DLCO ratio that is high greater than 1.8. So if you have either component A or component B, or if you have both of them, you should go on to have a right heart catheterization. If you're negative for component A and component B, then you can just be followed and undergo screening again with um, components A and B at six to 12 months. And finally, the detect algorithm. This algorithm uses a two-step process. So uh, they recommend first having non-echocardiographic parameters evaluated. And if you meet a certain threshold, then you go on to have an echo. So this is a little bit of a, a different technique than uh, the two initial studies. So the non-echo parameters include the pulmonary function test, the FVC to DLCO ratio, whether or not telangiectasias are present, the presence of anti-centromere antibody, looking at the NT pro BNP again, serum uric acid level, and looking at the EKG for a finding called right axis deviation, which is often seen when the right heart pressures are high. So each of these parameters is given a particular risk point score, and if you total them all up and have a score greater than 300, you go on to have an echocardiogram. For the echocardiogram, they look at two different parameters. Again, they look at that tricuspid regurgitant jet velocity, and they also look at the size of the right atrium. And each of those variables is given risk scores depending on what the findings are, and if it's greater than 35, you go on to have a right heart catheterization. So just to look at how the risk scores are calculated, uh, this is a nomogram for step one, showing all the individual um, parameters and the associated risk scores. And um, you total them all up, and if it meets, meets the, the threshold of 300 or more points, you go on to echocardiogram. Likewise, looking at points for the right atrial area and the tricuspid regurgitant jet velocity, if you add those risk points together and it's greater than 35, you go on to right heart catheterization. So looking at all these various algorithms that have been published over the years, um, a group of us got together to discuss and uh, develop guidelines or recommendations for screening for PAH in patients with scleroderma and other connective tissue diseases. So here are the, the guidelines that were published in 2013, and I just want to highlight a few things in the, the red boxes. First of all, um, there's very strong agreement that all patients with scleroderma whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, should undergo screening for PAH. And we'll go through what those screening tests should be in the next slide. The second major point is that all patients with systemic sclerosis and scleroderma spectrum disease uh, with a positive result on the screening test should go on to have a right heart catheterization. Right heart catheterization is mandatory for diagnosis of PAH. And then finally, the last point, um, there's a, a test that's done at the time of right heart catheterization at most centers called a vasodilator test. 
and this is when they give um, a medication that vasodilates your blood vessels actually during the right heart catheterization and if you meet certain criteria it's called a positive test and patients are often responsive to treatments called calcium channel blockers if they have a positive vasodilator test. In patients with scleroderma this is very very rarely the case and so recommendations have been that vasodilator testing should not be done in patients with scleroderma. I just wanted to point that out because at the end of the talk I'll be going through the algorithm for diagnosis and treatment in scleroderma. So what tests should be done? So the recommendations for initial screening um, in patients who are asymptomatic is very high for doing pulmonary function tests at baseline as well as transthoracic echocardiogram. And it's important that your doctor orders a PFT with the diffusion capacity, uh, not just the spirometry or the lung volumes alone. Uh, there's also quite a bit of evidence to support doing a baseline NT pro BNP to evaluate risk for pulmonary hypertension, even in asymptomatic patients. And then there's also a moderate degree of um, evidence supporting using the DETECT algorithm, which I just reviewed with you. So in terms of annual screening, um, there is evidence for annual screening in asymptomatic patients, but it's actually fairly low. Um, if a patient develops new signs or symptoms, then certainly annual screening with an echocardiogram or repeat echocardiogram is, is highly encouraged. Um, at many centers, including our own, we actually do do annual pulmonary function tests and echocardiogram just because we really have uh, found patients on an annual basis developing disease over time and we want to capture it early. As I mentioned, doing an annual echocardiogram can give you that rate of change of the right ventricular systolic pressure, so that can be very helpful. So there are several other screening modalities that are being ex explored, um, including exercise or stress echocardiography, exercise right heart catheterization, and cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, or cardiac MRI. And each of these um, is still in development and has uh, potential problems. So for the exercise um, echocardiograms, many different protocols and definitions of exercise have been um, used and they're currently not standardized, so definitely more research has to be done in this area. Exercise right heart catheterization can be very useful in identifying patients with early pulmonary hypertension. But not every site has a supine cycle ergometer, which is, is necessary to exercise the patient. And patients still feel that this is invasive. It is still a right heart catheterization. So whether we can do this on every patient to screen for PAH um, is in question. And then far, finally, the cardiac MRI um, requires a lot of expertise in um, being able to evaluate these, and they're also uh, quite expensive tests. So I think further research has to be done um, before these become uh, routine for screening of P for PAH. So again, highlighting the point, the diagnosis of PAH requires a right heart catheterization. So in terms of diagnosis of pH based on right heart catheterization, I just wanted to define some of the uh, variables or the information that we actually get out of the right heart catheterization and, and which can be very useful to your doctor in determining your status. So the mean pulmonary artery pressure I mentioned has to be at least 25 at rest to meet the diagnosis. Um, and increased pressures are, are often associated with worse prognosis at baseline. Pulmonary vascular resistance um, has to be greater than three wood units, and this is the resistance that has to be overcome to push blood through the circulatory system. The pulmonary arterial wedge pressure I mentioned earlier can be really helpful to differentiate between PAH and pulmonary hypertension related to heart disease. It's an indirect measure of the left atrial pressure, and it can be elevated with left-sided heart failure. So uh, the definition of PAH, again, requires that the wedge pressure be less than 15. And finally, the cardiac output is the amount of blood that's pumped by the heart per minute. 
In normal individuals, this ranges anywhere from four to eight liters per minute. But as your heart starts to fail, of course, the amount of blood you can pump out is lower. So the other important um, feature that should be assessed at the time of diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension is the WHO classification of functional status. So um, currently, medications approved for PAH are for patients with symptoms or functional status 2, 3, and 4. And just to review these so that you're aware, um, your doctor is going to be trying to assess how functional you are, asking you questions about your ordinary activities and, and whether you get symptoms or not. So in functional class one, there's no limitation of usual physical, physical activity. An ordinary activity does not result in symptoms. Functional class two, there's mild limitation of physical activity, no discomfort at rest, but normal physical activity can lead to symptoms. In functional class three, there's marked limitation of physical activity, no discomfort at rest, but less than ordinary activity can provoke symptoms. In functional class four, uh, patients are unable to do any physical activity, and there are symptoms even at rest. So I mentioned that the ECHO is extremely helpful in screening for pulmonary arter arterial hypertension, but it's also really useful to monitor patients after they've been diagnosed. So I mentioned the elevated right ventricular systolic pressure. This uh, pressure estimates the mean PAP in, in the lungs and can be followed over time. And uh, shown in the figure here, this is um, what's called an apical four-chamber view, um, showing it a picture of an echocardiogram. And uh, you can see the right atrium and the right ventricle, and the left atrium and left ventricle. So when you look at the echocardiogram, you can assess th the sizes of the right atrium and right ventricle, which can be very helpful in uh, monitoring patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension. So over time, as pressure develops, the right ventricle becomes larger and dilated. Um, so in a normal patient, the right ventricle to the left ventricle ratio is less than 0.6. So the right ventricle is much smaller than, the right ventricle is much smaller than the left in a normal healthy patient. Over time, as the right ventricle dilates, if it becomes the same size as the left ventricle or the ratio of the RV to LV becomes one to one, this indicates severe dilation of the right ventricle. So what's pointed out in the figure is uh, the right ventricle end systolic area and end diastolic area. So the end systolic area is after um, the heart contracts, that's how large uh, the right ventricle is. Whereas in diastole, that's when the heart relaxes. So you can measure it both with contraction and relaxation. Um, the other uh, feature that can be seen is there is flattening of the sept septum or wall between the right and left ventricles. So normally the left ventricle is bigger than the right and the septum bulges toward the right side. However, once uh, the right ventricle becomes uh, enlarged and there's more pressure there, it pushes the septum back so it's flattened in between. The wall it becomes flattened between the two ventricles. The other important uh, feature that we can look at in echocardiograms is the function of the right ventricle. And there's um, a variable called the TAPSI, or the tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, that can give you an estimate of the right ventricular pressure. So it's noted here, um, I'm sorry, I can't um, use my pointer to point it out, but the TAPSI basically measures um, this tricuspid annular plane distance um, when the heart contracts during systole. And if it moves less than 1.7 centimeters, this is thought to indicate a very stiff heart and indicates a decreased function of the right ventricle. So having a low TAPSI is associated with increased risk for progression of PAH. And then finally, there are a couple of other things that you can look for on the echocardiogram. You can measure the um, pulmonary artery and look for a dilated pulmonary artery. 
Um, you can also look for fluid around the heart or a pericardial effusion. And having fluid around the heart has been associated with worse outcomes in pulmonary hypertension as well. So uh, the final test I wanted to talk about in monitoring pulmonary hypertension in scleroderma patients is the six-minute walk test. And this test, um, I'm sure many of you have done them. Um, you basically walk on a flat surface for six minutes, and your doctor will be measuring your oxygen saturation as well as the distance you're able to walk. So it's important to um, Remember that in patients with scleroderma who often have bad ray nodes that uh, you really should be using a forehead probe rather than a finger probe to look at the oxygen level in the bloodstream. So in terms of the distance walked, um, if you're only able to walk 300 meters or less in the six minute time period, that's a marker of high risk for pulmonary hypertension progression. The goal is to be able to walk more than 400 meters. And with treatment, um, the hope is to improve the six-minute walk test by at least 33 meters, which has shown, been shown to be associated with a clinically important difference in how the patient is doing. Now, it's really important to realize in scleroderma patients that the six-minute walk test can be affected by other problems related to scleroderma. So patients who are anemic, who have underlying interstitial lung disease, arthritis or myositis, that can all affect the six-minute walk test. So those caveats have to be taken into consideration when um, patients are undergoing this test. And really, it's your own relative uh, six-minute walk test that's important, um, but you want to make sure that these other factors are not playing a role. So uh, now I'm going to talk about the current treatment options for PAH. This slide highlights the general measures for PAH treatment, and these treatments have been around for many, many years, but are still extremely useful. So supplemental oxygen, absolutely helpful for symptom control. And, um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, and uh, the goal is to keep saturations greater than 90%. Water pills or diuretics are really, really helpful to uh, control the swelling that can occur with PAH. Anticoagulants like Coumadin, um, these are blood thinners and they're not indicated for all patients. Um, your doctor may consider using them if you're at higher risk for developing blood clots, um, such as if you have a history of blood clots and have the presence of antiphospholipid antibodies. If you have a history of uh, gastrointestinal bleeding um, in patients with scleroderma, they can develop GAVE or gastric antral vascular ectasias that are uh, malformations in the stomach that can bleed. So that would be an absolute contraindication or um, you would avoid anticoagulants in those patients. Other uh, general measures include uh, having a supervised exercise training program but at the same time, avoiding physical activity that is too strenuous. Um, in females of uh, childbearing capacity, we do recommend that you avoid pregnancy, which is a major stress on the body. And finally, um, getting the flu and pneumococcal vaccines is extremely important. So there are four major uh, drug classes for the treatment of PAH, and they work at different um, pathways. There are three major pathways that are thought to be involved in leading to PAH. Um, and these include the endothelin pathway, the nitric oxide pathway, and the prostacyclin pathway. So phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, is um, these are a class of drugs that enhance the effects of nitric oxide, the, the middle pathway shown in the figure. And nitric oxide is a substance that opens up the blood vessels and decreases the pressure in the lungs. Endothelin receptor antagonists, or ERAs, uh, block a very powerful vasoconstrictor called endothelin-1. And then that leads to relaxation and opening up of the blood vessels. Guanylate cyclase stimulators, again, work on the nitric oxide pathway and stimulate the release of nitric oxide. And then prostanoids or prostacyclin receptor agonists work on the prostacyclin pathway. And prostacyclins, again, are substances that open up the blood vessels and decrease pressure in the lungs.
So currently in the United States, we have two FDA-approved phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, sildenafil and tadalafil. Sildenafil is taken by mouth. Um, recommended doses are three times a day, and tadalafil is a once-a-day pill. Uh, these medications can um, rarely lead to vision changes, um, indigestion, flushing, and uh, uh, nasal congestion can occur with either one of these agents. The endothelin receptor antagonists um, are available in three different forms. Bosantin is the oldest medication and it is an oral medicine that's taken twice daily. Uh, this medication has an increased risk for liver inflammation, so if you do uh, take Bosantin, you need to have monitoring of your liver function tests on a monthly basis. Ambrosentin is given once daily and macetentin as well, and that's the most recent uh, endothelin receptor antagonist that's been approved. So all of these, again, um, can lead to similar side effects, headache, Swelling, um, lower extremity edema is often seen with ambrosentin, um, and nasal congestion again can be seen with any of these. Riosaguat is a guanylate cyclase stimulator, and this is a fairly uh, newly approved drug that is available by mouth three times a day. And again, similar side effects can occur, some GI side effects with diarrhea, lightheadedness, indigestion, headache, and nausea. And the prostanoids can come in multiple different flavors. So epiprostanol is the oldest drug um, available by continuous IV infusion. Iloprost uh, in the United States is available by an intermittent inhaled formulation. And true prostanol is available in many different formulations, including continuous subcutaneous infusion, a continuous IV infusion, an inhaled formulation, or by mouth given three times a day. Again, um, all of the prostanoids can be associated with the risk for GI side effects, diarrhea, headache, uh, jaw pain, uh, flushing, nausea. Um, Epiprostanol and um, IV triprostanol also has the, in the increased risk of um, potential infection at the catheter site. And Selexipag, so this is a very newly uh, approved medication that is a prostacyclin receptor agonist. It's an oral medication um, available by mouth twice a day. And again, very similar uh, side effects as the other prostacyclin analogs, headache, diarrhea, nausea, and jaw pain. So again, this is a summary slide just to show the three different pathways thought to be involved in pulmonary hypertension pathogenesis. And um, just highlighting, uh, circled in, in the white boxes, are the currently available medications. So Riosaguat works on the um, uh, soluble guanylate cyclase and increases uh, the nitric oxide pathway. Likewise, sildenafil and tadalafil, those are the phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors working on the nitric oxide pathway. Uh, those working on the prostacyclin pathway, so Lexapeg, the uh, prostacyclin receptor agonist, and the prostacyclin analogs, epiprostanol, triprostanol, and iloprost. And then finally, um, the agents working on the endothelin-1 pathway, ambrosentin, bosantin, and macetentin. So um, more recently, studies have looked at combinations of these therapies to see if they're more effective than taking one drug at a time. This is a study that uh, was published a couple of years ago called the Ambition Study. In this study, uh, patients with functional class 2 or 3 pulmonary arterial hypertension were treated upfront at their initial diagnosis of PAH with either a combination of ambrosentin plus tadalafil or monotherapy with either one of these, either ambrosentin or tadalafil. So looking at a combined endpoint uh, or risk for clinical failure, which was defined as death, hospitalization for PAH, or disease progression of their PAH. Patients who were treated with upfront therapy with the combination of ambrosentin and tadalafil had a much lower risk for clinical progression than if you were treated with one therapy or the other alone. 
So this uh, graph here shows the overall results for patients with all forms of PAH. But looking at the connective tissue disease group, which, which was primarily comprised of scleroderma patients, the results were even more dramatic, showing that combination therapy was better than monotherapy in preventing PAH progression. So lung transplantation as a treatment for PAH. So lung transplantation can, can really be a life-saving procedure, um, but unfortunately not a, all patients are eligible for this procedure. And your eligibility is based on a score called the lung allocation score, which is uh, measured on a scale of zero to 100. And only patients with functional class three or four symptoms who are on IV prostacyclins and potentially oral medications as well can be eligible for lung transplantation. Other factors such as age, weight, the presence of diabetes or kidney failure, the severity of pulmonary hypertension and oxygen requirement are all taken into account in the lung allocation score and uh, where you stand on the list for a lung transplant. The other important feature that determines whether a patient will be listed for transplant is the severity of their gastroesophageal reflux. The concern is that GERD can lead to aspiration post-transplant, which can cause trouble and problems in the transplanted lung. So oftentimes, um, when being assessed for lung transplant, you will have to undergo a test looking at the severity of GERD or reflux. The good thing is, is if you do get a transplant, you're just as likely to survive if you have scleroderma-associated pulmonary hypertension as if as uh, those with idiopathic disease. So um, really, lung transplantation could be a life-saving therapy if you're eligible. So this is just a summary slide of where we stand in the current era in terms of treatment for PAH. So at the top, um, a patient who is evaluated uh, for PAH should be seen at a PAH expert center uh, where a right heart catheterization can be performed. Um, again, the acute vasoreactivity test is not applicable for scleroderma patients, but um, once you diagnose PAH by right heart catheterization, you should assess the functional status of the patient. And if um, a patient is functional class two or three, uh, patients could either be treated with initial monotherapy with uh, one of the different classes of oral drugs that I discussed, or um, probably more frequently now, we're starting patients up front on combination therapy, oral combination therapy. For those who are functional class four, uh, initial combination therapy is highly recommended and including IV prostacyclins. So clinical response is reassessed after being treated with the initial therapy, and if a patient is uh, progressing, then consideration for referral for lung transplant should be done. Um, if a patient is progressing but still fairly um, moderate or mild in severity, double or triple sequential uh, combination therapy may be done. Um, and again, if inadequate response, then consideration for lung transplantation. So I'm going to end with uh, my summary slide here, uh, just to review some of the major points I've gone through in this talk that I'd like as take-home points for you. So first of all, pulmonary hypertension is high blood pressure in the lungs, and it's a complication that affects probably about 7% of scleroderma patients by right heart catheterization, and mostly due to pulmonary arterial hypertension. Risk factors for the development of PAH include uh, telangiectasias, history of digital ulcers, having a low diffusion capacity on pulmonary function test, increased right ventricular systolic pressure on echocardiogram, autoantibodies such as the anti-centromere antibodies, and elevated NT proBNP in the blood. All patients with scleroderma should be screened for PAH with pulmonary function tests, echocardiogram, and NT proBNP, even if asymptomatic. Right heart catheterization is necessary for the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. And finally, the treatment of PAH in the current era includes general supportive measures, medical therapies, which can be taken in combination, and lung transplantation for severe cases. <laughs>
So I want to thank you all for uh, your attention this morning. I'm happy to take questions and just to thank all of my uh, collaborators at the Stanford Scleroderma Center and finally again the Scleroderma Foundation for holding this wonderful conference. Thank you. Thank you.